Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, uh, it's been a long time since we've been able to get together, and um, I'm really happy to, um, to carve out this space and time again to be together. I'm going to let people, um, as we're going, I'm going to let people continue to join in the shiur, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get started. So um, I want to begin by uh, saying that um, I miss having our weekly shiurim. I miss doing it on a weekly basis, and I'm trying to balance my feelings about that with my other responsibilities, as I had sent out in my email um, and, uh, and truthfully, in light of the last like three to four weeks of um, prior to my father-in-law's passing, um, things were very, very much um, busy and hectic. So I'm, I'm going to stick to the original schedule that I had set with that revised schedule. Um, I'll, I don't have it in front of me, but I'll resend it when I post the recordings. Um, I, I do have a goal of eventually being able to get back to weekly shiur, but with other shim, we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, and um, I want to remember at the end, I want to um, share with you unrelated some uh, reflections and insights also on how um, we've discussed before, how the Yetzir Hara uh, gets you busy and uh, away from a lot of things that can shed light. So if we remember, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that towards the end. Um, at any rate, welcome. Thank you. I want to start um, by saying that I'm, this uh, shiur is going to be slightly different than ones I've done in the past. I think the ones I've done in the past have been um, very text-based and a little bit more on the academic side. Um, I decided I think I want to take this year, if it's okay, and have it be a little bit more free-flowing and to share with you a little bit about my life experiences in the last month or so, um, as specifically as relates to um, things I learned and saw and experienced um, in the context of being a religious Jew and um, caring for my father-in-law, uh, who was... Um, uh, on his downward trend and then eventually passing away. So I want to, um, first of all, start with thank yous, like I always like to do. Uh, first of all, thank you, Hashem, that we're back here together again, an opportunity to continue our work together and to continue breathing and living and learning. And um, I want to make the shiur for Lilui Nishmas, um, first and foremost, my father-in-law, Alfred, Ben, Nisim, and Regina, um, who it's been um, about, actually, it's two weeks today that he was um, buried in Yerushalayim. And um, I also want to make it Leluli Nishmas Aliyah Bas Avraham, who is the mother uh, who passed very tragically uh, in this, I, I believe it was about a week ago, um, as well as the two young boys in Israel and the young man in Israel who were nifter. I unfortunately don't have their exact names in front of me, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows who they are. And I would like part of what we do to be in Leilu Nishmas for them and Chizuk for their family and support. And a Rafu Shlema for Mazel Tov Bas Bracha, who is one of the members of our group and uh, members of the uh, Bas Melech group. And she's, she's unfortunately contracted COVID again and not, not doing very well right now. So we'll pray for her refua. Uh, okay, so let's begin. Again, if you have any comments, questions, please don't hesitate to jump in. And also, if you want to dedicate the shiur for someone that you know that needs um, any davening or chizuk, please, by all means, put it in the chat. We're, we're welcoming uh, with that for everybody. So I would like to start by telling you a little bit about my father-in-law. Um, some of you knew him. And some of the people who hear this recording uh, will have known him. Uh, he was a very um, strong character. He had a very strong character, a very unique uh, presence and character. He was a funny guy. He always had a big smile and a big laugh. And he was super, super independent. And one of the things my husband and I comment about him is that we say in Hebrew, Hulomevater. He, he, you know, this, the saying mevater, like meaning like you kind of give up. So that's a hulomevater, meaning 
He was so strong, even until his last day, he fought every step of the way. And I say that in a good way, meaning like he was, he was, he was not going to go easily. He wanted to make the most of every second that he had. And he really pushed. He had everybody fooled. He had everyone fooled. He had the hospice staff fooled. He had the, the med techs fooled. Everybody, you know, I knew him very, very well. My husband and I, Baruch Hashem, were together almost 15 years. And I make, I always joke that I'm together with my husband almost 15 years and I'm together with Alfred almost 15 years. Alfred had been divorced for already 30 years and he never remarried. And it was like a package deal. Like I got my husband and I, sh- I found out shortly thereafter that I also got Alfred, which is a really a big blessing. And, um, and so I had a very unique relationship with him. I would say it was one that was, that was more than your typical uh, father-in-law, daughter-in-law type of relationship. He really looked at me like a daughter, and he treated me like a daughter, and he loved me like a daughter. And I was showing people during the shiva that I have a, a huge envelope Uh, a a folder full of letters, handwritten letters. He was an incredible writer and poet. He was a master of like seven different languages. Uh, He could read and write uh, and speak multiple languages. And he would write me letters. He would write me, I call them love notes, little love notes, where he would bless me and he would come for Shabbos and give me a letter and a flower. Uh, He would celebrate my birthday. He was known for starting to celebrate my birthday specifically one month before my birthday. I would start to get birthday cards and notes from him blessing me and blessing the family and telling me how much he appreciates us and telling me how much he loves to come to our house. And, and these are the aspects of Alfred that I, uh, treasure and cherish. I apologize (laughs) if I get emotional, it's still kind of fresh and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to have those keepsakes and those memories. Sorry. And so part of my reflections in all of this is to to say that when people that we know, not even necessarily know that we love, or in Alfred's case, I knew I did love him, um, but that when we, when we, we don't necessarily know and understand uh, what is a keepsake, until it becomes a keepsake. And, and that's one of the things that I realized. Um, things that we receive from others, we, we don't necessarily always value them fully um, until we realize like that's, that's the end of them, meaning there won't be any more forthcoming. And I'm so thankful that I, um, that I kept those notes from him and that I kept all of the cards he wrote for the kids and, and those kinds of things. Because now, you know, what just seemed to be like a normal birthday card or whatever, it's now a family treasure and it's now something that will, you know, put together in an album and so forth and to sit and to go through it. Um, the end of Alfred's life was not easy. Alfred he suffered immensely. He, as they say in Hebrew, was really a Baal Yisurim. Um, and interestingly enough, part of what I'm learning is about the whole process of death and dying, and specifically in the realm of Yiddishkeit and Torah. And um, even something as, um, well, I guess not simple, but something as mundane as let's say writing what's going to be on the headstone for the person. I've learned that even this in Shammai matters. And I think that another takeaway from this entire experience is that everything in Shammai, and when I say Shammai, I want to remind you I'm referring to heaven. I'm referring to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's, um, you know, 90 something percent of the world that we don't see, um, the things that exist beyond our physical realm and what we're able to see and connect with. That's when I say Shamaim, that literally means heavens or skies, that everything in Shamaim 
matters. Uh, everything that happens here in our world matters in Shamaim. There is nothing that goes undocumented or unnoticed. Even to the extent I learned in the last two weeks that what you write on a person's headstone will be reviewed in Shamaim. It will be reviewed by the base dean. It will be reviewed by the base dean that's passing the judgments on the neshama. And so if there is a uh, guideline, I guess, I don't know what is a better word to use, that whatever you write on the headstone of a person, you have to be very, very careful not to exaggerate or not to put things on a headstone that could be considered an untruth. Because what will happen in Shamaim is that when that headstone is placed, they'll call on the neshama to account for what's written there. So if something on there rings as, God forbid, untrue or an exaggeration, the neshama will be called to testify as to why that's written on their headstone. And God forbid, God forbid, if something on there is not justifiable, then chas v'shalom, the neshama, can actually be held accountable for that. And so I thought to myself, wow, what an, un, what an unbelievable lesson for us in the living to know that if, if in shamayim they care so much about what's written on someone's headstone, all the more that they care about every single thing that we do and say and think while we're in this physical world. It's such an eye-opener for us and such a lesson that every single thing we do here matters so much and weighs heavily and impacts others. And not just here, not just in the physical world, but in the world of Nishamos. So this has been a, an extremely enlightening experience to witness... Um, the last days of my father-in-law, to witness what he went through, uh, to observe what the physical body and the neshama go through. Um, when I began to suspect that he was coming close to his end, I kind of kept conveying that to the people around us, to the hospice staff and the and the um, the med, med tech staff and the assisted living and so forth. And everyone kept saying to me. Um, but his vitals are great, and, and, and his color is great, and this is great, and look, he's talking. Someone, someone you know, who is coming close to the end wouldn't be talking, and it wouldn't necessarily be cognizant. And you know, they didn't know Alfred the way I knew Alfred. They didn't know and understand his koach, his strength, and his conviction, and his, um, and his sheer will. And, and I, I kept saying to them, you know, but he's not able to eat and drink. And so how long can someone be sustained? You know, this was a part of his decline, unfortunately, was that um, he had situ physical issues that eventually got to a point where he could no longer eat and drink. Uh, and, and ultimately, this was a part of what led to his finish. Um, but I, I, I kept observing and starting to do my own research, and I kept seeing things that are well documented in the literature about what happens to a person when they're close to passing. And, um, and so I, I had a sense, but it wasn't being reinforced by, by really the community around me that were professionals. And I don't say that in a derogatory way. I just say that they're doing based on what they've learned in textbooks and, and, and yes, based on experience and even based of all, on all of that, um, everyone was very surprised. Um, but I will tell you that the Thursday, he passed on a Monday morning, the Thursday morning, um, I had been there pretty much um, every day um, for a couple of weeks um, past, you know, before his passing. I was there a significant amount of time, as was my husband. Thursday morning when I came in, um, let's see, Thursday morning before I came in, I, um, 
I, when I came into his room, I saw that things were not looking very well, and um, I contacted my husband. And Thursday, although it was a difficult day for Alfred, he was in and out of consciousness. And um, but uh, a significant part of the family was able to come on that day and um, and say their their goodbyes. Um, and uh, he was, uh, when he was awake, he was very alert. And that was a part of what was throwing everybody off. In the moments that he was awake, he was very lucid. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what he wanted to say. Um, he had difficulty speaking at the end. Um, but um, it, it was a very important day of closure, I think, for the family. I, I think for him as well, although at that point, I'm not so sure he was really on board with the fact that he was coming close to his end. Um, but um, everybody kind of said their goodbyes. When I came back Friday morning, I couldn't believe what I saw. 6 a.m., I walked in the room. He was sitting up in bed with his feet on the floor, telling me that he was late for breakfast. And I said, okay, let's go. Let's change. Let's get ready. Let's, let's do this. You know, he was like pointing to his watch going, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. And I, I was able to reassure him. No, 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 you're not late. You're good. It's only 6am. Breakfast is not for another hour, but let's, you know, let's get you dressed. Let's get going. I called everybody. Some of his granddaughters, his adult granddaughters had come in town to see him. And I called them right away. I said, come over again, come now because he's awake, like spend time. They came. My husband came. We all went to breakfast with him. He was, he was like, he was like back, you know, and I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's see what's going on. I later learned that this is actually not uncommon. I later learned that, uh, that the soul, the neshama senses that it's kind of coming to the end. And even without realizing it rallies to fight and, and the, the, all, that a person when they're close to the end can suddenly look good and they can suddenly be like doing things that you're like, what, what's going on here? So we enjoyed that time with him, and um, Baruch Hashem, he, uh, he made it through Shabbat. We spend more time with him on Sunday, and um, on, on Monday morning, uh, I got a call, and um, I, I ran over there, and uh, when I got there, um, his pulse was 45. I said Shema with him. I blessed him. And about 60 to 90 seconds later, he passed. And um, I sat with him and stayed with him from that point forward until my husband could come and, um, and Chavra Kadisha and all the things that unfold um, right after those final moments. It was, um, I'm very thankful to say I had had no experience with death up until that point. Although my grandparents had all passed away, I was not there physically when they were. Um, I was not really involved in, in the caring for a person at end of life, nor had ever been with someone when they passed. Um, it was very, obviously, as you would imagine, very emotional. Um, but it was also, from what I've learned, I guess a very big schluss. I guess um, on some level, the neshama gets to um, pick who's with them when they pass. And I was the lucky one. So I'm very honored for that. And I'm very thankful to Alfred. It was a very important moment, special moment. And it's one that I won't forget. So, um, sorry. So in those moments after he passed, it wasn't so much a surprise that he was passing, but for the, anyone who's ever had an experience with death, I'm sure they can attest to the fact that there's obviously a finality to death that it's hard to reconcile, even though you know it intellectually, that it hits you um, after someone passes that like, that's it. <laughs> um, not that their memory won't be for a blessing, not that they don't leave physical things behind, but that, um, that the sound of their voice and the warmth of their smile and those things that 
speak to us, neshama to neshama, in our interactions with other human beings are just no longer there. The neshama has moved on to its, to its next place, and the body is, is no longer necessary until Bezat Hashem Mashiach comes. And so there's that aspect of things that, um, that the mind tries to reconcile. And what I saw happen with myself, with his grandchildren, with my husband, is there is a, I believe it's a natural psychological aspect that takes place where at some point along the line, within the few days after the passing, there is a conversation that begins to happen in the mind about, could I have done things differently? Should I have done things differently? Did I do everything that I could? It's a very, very difficult conversation that the psychology of the human being brings forward to the mind as you begin to assess and evaluate all of your interactions with this person and try to come to terms with anything that you remember as maybe being hard or that you wish you would not have said or things you wish you would have done or how you would have done it differently. And, um, and I've come to understand that, um, that, that this is actually something that although it's natural, the, the Jewish way is to not engage in those kinds of thought processes. The Jewish way is to trust. The Jewish way is to know that for the most part, we can, we can give a thinking that our, ourselves and others really do. I think the majority of people, at least observant Jews, I think are trying to do the best that they can with what they have at that time. And, you know, it's impossible for each of us, especially if we're on a trajectory of growth and self-reflection and, 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 and having a desire to learn and grow as a human being, it's impossible to judge ourselves in the past based on who we are now, because we were not this person a week ago, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, a lifetime ago. We were not this person. We did not have the skills that we have today then. And so we have to trust that we did the best that we could in that time and that we're trying to do the best that we can right now and that a week from now and a year from now and five years from now, God willing, we'll be doing even better. And and so we can't we can't judge ourselves looking back. Hindsight is always 2020. And and so and we are not the same people that you know hopefully hopefully if we're doing our work we're not the same people today that we were then. And so that's a part of this mental conversation that takes pay, place after someone that we're close to passes. I will tell you that the rachamim, the mercy of a Baruch Hu is endless. And I saw that firsthand um, in what he arranged for my husband and I here in our home. Um, We had arranged weeks and weeks ago for a wonderful rabbi and his rabbitson, Rabbi Rabbitson Dahan from El Ad in, in Israel. They were planning to come to Los Angeles for a visit. Not for any particular reason, but the, you know, the rabbi is a Rosh Hashiva, he does fundraising, and she was joining with, and they were going to be here for a total of 10 days, and it had been arranged for a long time, and they were staying, they were going to be staying with us, we were going to host them. Sunday, before my, fa- my father-in-law's passing, uh, had been a really, really difficult day, very, very difficult day, uh, emotionally, and with Alfred, my husband and I got home from Alfred's about 5 p.m., we were exhausted on every level. And all of a sudden, I get a voice note on WhatsApp um, from the rabbi. And the voice note says, hi, we've just landed at LAX. We should be at your house in about 20 to 30 minutes. And we're really looking forward to seeing you. And I looked at my husband and he looked at me. We had completely and totally forgotten that they were coming. We had absolutely lost track of time. The days had been running into each other. We didn't know which end was up, trying to balance everything and also be there for Alfred. So my husband, I send immediately my husband with my daughter to the grocery store. I'm like, go buy this, go buy this, go buy that. I run, a, I run to go make beds and put clean towels and make sure everything is clean for them. And 
And I thought, okay, maybe now I need to feed them. I, I didn't know. I didn't. I wasn't sure what what they're going to want, uh, how they're going to feel, and. Um, basically they got here we welcomed them we didn't say anything at all that we had forgotten uh, they were exhausted and they decided to go straight to bed so they went to bed we went to bed the foul morning fouling morning is what I had said about Alfred having passed I have zero experience with Shiva I had been telling my husband for about a month that I want to do the best I can for him but I don't know what I'm doing. Please tell me what you need from me because I don't know what to do. I don't know anything. Not only do I not know anything, I'm Ashkenazi. Even the Shiva houses I've been to for Shiva visits are Ashkenazi Shiva houses. I know nothing about Sephardic Shiva or what the differences are, which I learned there are significant differences between a Sephardic Shiva home and an Ashkenazi Shiva home. So not only did I not know what to do, I like doubly did not know what to do. I felt at a total loss. And this rabbi in Rebetzin arrived the night before Alfred's passing, and their flight to leave was the night after Shiva ended. And Hashem arranged this in such a way that these two kind, righteous, tzaddikim human beings he is a Rosh Yeshiva. They are Sephardic. They know everything from Halakha to Minhag, exactly what needs to happen. I say that the rabbi caught my husband and the Rebetzin caught me. And they, in their wisdom and their kochos, with their strength and their grace, carried us through what I would say was one of the most challenging and difficult times to date that we had to, to, to walk through. And I, I say with absolute conviction, I don't believe we could have done it without them. And Hashem knew that. And I'm so thankful to them for everything that they did for us and, and, and how they just unceasingly and, and with no expectation of anything helped 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, through all of it. Uh, I'm just, I'm just so, so awestruck by how Hashem, and if you hear, they have their own stories about things that happened on their end. The rabbi, he, they accidentally booked to come to Los Angeles in one of the most major Shabbat, Shabbaton weekends of his yeshiva, and he's the Rosh Yeshiva. And in the end, the students were trying to tell him, no, you have to cancel your trip. You have to cancel your trip. You have to be with us. This is it. This is the weekend. And, and, and through whatever happened, they found out they couldn't cancel. I don't know exactly what, why. They could not cancel it. They couldn't get their money back. They couldn't, I, I don't know what happened. So they were sharing with us the Sa'at of the Shmaya, the Hashkacha Pratis on their end as well of why they had to be here. Anybody who says God doesn't run the world is, is living in, in a fantasy because when you see something like that, there's no denying the existence of God and there's no denying his hashkacha on everything that happens. Everything that happens. And so this was, this was a mamish a ness, a miracle, a miracle. And I, and I call it out for being, an, in my eyes, an open miracle because there's really no other explanation. They arrive the night before and they leave the night after. It was like exactly the time. So, so this was something that we have to know that in everything Hashem does, how he chooses to do it, it's the best way. Even if we don't understand it and we don't see it, we need to know that everything he does is in the best way and for the best. And this is 100% a foundational element of Torah life, of living. Again, I go back to my example. Gravity doesn't care if you believe in it, right? Gravity holds you to the earth one way or the other. And it is the same exact concept. Hashem is with you and in your life in every single detail, whether you believe in Him or you believe in His, his power to organize and, and, and to, to, to orchestrate. Regardless of our belief, He's there. Every second... And in every way, and uh, and I saw this, I saw this full on in this entire shiva process. I want to share um, a reflection about holding space 
for others. When I say holding space for another human being, what I mean is when you enter into a period of time within the context of a relationship where it's no longer about you in any way, where you come to a realization that anything that you need physically, spiritually, emotionally, or otherwise gets tabled and, and you put yourself in the role of grace and holding space for another human being so that they don't have to hold themselves in a time when they can't hold themselves. And, and this is the space I found myself working hard to step into in the context of Shiva for my husband. I had known ahead of time that I wanted to do that. I was not sure of my capability to do it. It had not been tested that much before. Uh, to hold for space for someone to that degree. Um, but I, I really did the best that I could to try to hold space for my husband. How I knew that I was successful to the degree that I did it to the best that I could. I'm not saying I did it the best. I'm saying I did it the best that I could, that I could try to do. Um, and I don't say that again to tap myself on the back. I, I say that to share the reflection on how I knew and what it felt like. Um, so that when you either need to hold space for someone else or someone needs to hold space for you, you can recognize the feelings around it and you can bring it to your consciousness that will be able to push you forward even more to be able to either be there for someone else or to allow other people to be there for you, which is sometimes actually harder. It's sometimes harder as women to allow others to hold space for us because we are so used to holding space for everyone around us. We generally hold space for our spouse, for our children, for our parents, for our community. That's, that's a part of how Hashem created us as a vessel to hold space for others. But to do so intently to the point that we have to table anything that has to do with our own, our own needs is, is, is kind of an extreme level of that, right? We cannot continuously operate at that level because otherwise it will negatively impact us, will burn out. Right? So it's not necessarily a healthy space to be in when you're fully giving at 100%. But sometimes we have to do that. In, a, in an issue of death, especially death of a parent, God forbid death of a loved one, people need to be held. Um, and they need space held for them. So in the Shiva process, which was in and of itself very interesting, you can see a lot about a person's character based on how they behave in a Shiva home. A Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, someone who's well-versed in the ways of Torah, understands that the role of a person in a Shiva house is to simply come in, pay their respect, and then sit down quietly and listen to the person who's mourning so that they can speak about their loved one and share stories. And what I saw is that that process of sharing stories about a loved one is exceptionally cathartic and an integral part of the healing process that Hashem created in the whole entire process of sitting Shiva. When you talk about someone and you share stories and you cry and you, um, you, you, you laugh and you, uh, you, you, you share important memories and, and people are receptive and listening and even asking questions to learn more, it's very, very healing. It's very healing for the person who's mourning. And so I saw the differences between people who understood uh, what Shiva is for um, and people who were essentially ignorant of what Shiva is for. I saw the difference between the, the way that my husband felt in the presence of people who understood and respected the process versus people who who came and they, they, didn't, they were just not familiar with it. it again, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a blaming way. I'm just saying it in an observational way that when, when people are uneducated in the ways of Torah, 
and they don't take the time to learn, it can actually have a negative impact on the environment, in particular in the Shiva house, which is a very sensitive environment. Not only that, but we know that the Nishama is in the Shiva house for the, the entire duration of Shiva. And the Nishama can see and hear everything going on. That's a part of why we cover mirrors. It's a part of why we, we, we cover photos in, in, in certain traditions. Um, it's all for the, for the health and welfare of the Nishama. So it's worth it um, to educate yourself about the ways of, of making a, a Shiva call, you know, a, a visit to a Shiva house to, to learn a little bit more about that. So going back to the concept of holding space, um, at the end of Shiva, uh, there was Shachrit in the morning. There's a minion in the house every day uh, for, for Shachrit, Mincha, and Mariv. At the end of Shiva, uh, the... The rabbi and the members of the minion come around the person who's mourning. In this case, it was my husband. The, the mourners are sitting on low chairs. They're sitting there the entire week. They're not supposed to leave the house. They're not supposed to really walk around much. That's why it's called shiva. It's from shev, sitting. Seven, sitting, shev. It's all tied together. And the rabbi came. Um, I came in to see what's going on because I was very interested the rabbi said some words to my husband. I don't know what they were exactly, but they were in Hebrew. And the essence of those words were basically like um, blessing the neshama, that he should go to Gan Eden. Uh, blessing my husband, that he should re-enter into life. And, and there's like a formal getting up. They gave my husband, the rabbi gave him his hand and helped him to stand up. And everybody said some words related to this um, to this uh, custom. The moment that my husband stood up, I lost it. I lost it. I completely and totally burst into tears. I went into the kitchen. The Robinson came to me. She cried with me. I, I I wept for probably ten minutes. I just could not stop crying. And I think it was at that moment that somehow psychologically I understood that I was now able to step back and not have to hold space for my husband in the same way that I had throughout the Shiva process. And it was okay for me to now, I don't know how else to say, like let my guard down or um, release a little bit of that vigilance. I was kind of like on call 24 seven and, and being very vigilant. What does my husband need? Does he need a drink? Does he need to eat? Does he need to rest? What does he need? And I just burst into tears and it was like a floodgate release of trying to process everything and trying to recognize that I also had feelings of mourning that I had not had an opportunity to work through and that my husband made it through the Shiva and that we have to start life again and we, and how different things would be without Alfred, without his phone calls and without visiting him. And, um, you know, every Motse Shabbos for 15 years, if he wasn't with us in our house for Shabbos, the very first thing I would do is call him. How was your Shabbos? Where did you go? And he would tell me all about his Shabbos and what he ate and who he saw and that he gave a lecture in this shul and he gave another shear in this shul and there would be this whole like download on Motzi Shabbos about what he did and where he was and, and I'll miss that. I'll miss that. Um, I'll miss that. And it's those kinds of things that led me to this... Um, this kind of final reflection that I'll share with you. Obviously, when someone passes away, um, you know, that's it. We, we, we are, we're no longer granted the blessing of the communication, um, the sound of their voice, and, and, and all those things I mentioned before. But what I observed in my husband as he was going through his process, in my children, um, in his grandchildren, you know, and even for myself, is that when, when death happens, it seems that suddenly things become very clear, like things you couldn't see before about the person jump on you. Good things even, like 
suddenly, you know, all these years you thought he was doing certain things for one reason and you get this clarity that it was for an entirely different reason. And that in many ways, you don't even know a person. You realize that there was a tzidkut, there was a righteousness to the person that existed that in our own ignorance, we've written off as some kind of a flaw or that we disagree with how he was doing things or we don't see the logic or the reasoning. And, and now, now that he's not here and we go back and we look and we question and we ask and we say, oh my gosh, he was doing it because of X, but we thought he's doing it because of Y. It is, it is literally possible to know someone well and still not know various aspects about who they are. To still not be able to see the righteousness in others when they're standing right in front of you. When you have relationship with them on an ongoing basis, it's possible to miss it. It's possible to be ignorant. It's possible to not, to not judge fairly if it's even our place to judge at all. I mean, that was really like, that's a boucha. That's almost an embarrassment. When you realize in hindsight, places where you judged, where it's like not your business, it's not your place to judge. You know, for, for you know, the, the saying, I don't know if there's the saying in Hebrew, but we certainly know it in America. You know, you can't judge until you've walked in another's shoes. And we do it all the time. We judge people all the time. We even do it unconsciously. And, um, and it, it's a tough thing to swallow, to think back and see that, that you know, you very well could have missed something entirely or, or just been plain wrong. And, um, and it's, and it's a process. And I, and I realized that all these questions and all these insights are, are a, an integral part of the healing that needs to take place after someone that you've loved or cared for or someone in your life has passed away because you're on your own now to reconcile those things. You can't reconcile it anymore with the other person. They're not available to you. They're in a different place now. And, and you have to figure out for yourself how to reconcile those insights and those feelings. And it made me think to myself how silly we are, how silly we are that we don't understand that all those insights that we experience when someone passes away are available to us now while people are still alive. We're just choosing not to see them. We're choosing not to go there. We're choosing not to engage. We're choosing not to heal. We're choosing not to reach the olive branch out. If someone else doesn't accept our olive branch, we don't have control on others. We only have control on what we do. But there's so much processing that takes place after a person passes away. And it's, it's I would say, for the most part, processing that could be done while the person is still living. And I think that's one of the primary reflections that I've taken away with me from this, away with me from this experience with my father-in-law is to know that I observe, I observe myself, I observe my husband, I observe the people who are around him, their thoughts, their feelings, regrets, wishing things could have been different or they would have done things differently. And I say to myself, this is our work now. When Hashem takes someone from our lives, when Hashem takes someone either close to us, like my father-in-law was very close to me, or takes a member of Am Yisrael who clearly was Kadosh, Kodesh Kodashim, these boys in Israel were, the 20-year-old and the two boys, there were two and four, three and five, I don't know the exact age. It's personal. It's personal. We have to take it personally. We have to look and understand that when we're witnessing a passing, when, when, de- when Hashem used death, when Hashem uses death as his methodology for teaching, we need to understand that whatever he's trying to teach us is life or death. We have to learn it. We have to take it to heart. We have to ask ourselves, why? 
What are these neshamos being taken from us for? Why is our loved one finishing his life at this time and not a year from now or 10 years from now? Why now? What are we meant to learn? And it's not about placing blame, but it's, it, is about, it is about elevating our consciousness. It is about understanding that nothing is by accident, which is what I was talking about at the very, very beginning. We have to know that a part of our responsibility is to look around us and ask ourselves, where do we need to heal and where do we need to facilitate healing? Where do we need to apologize? Where do we need to speak up? Where do we need to reach out? Where do we need to stop judging? Where do we need to stay in our own lane? Where do we need to stop blaming? Where do we need to accept? And where do we need to love? where we're not loving? It's, it's not, they're not easy questions, and I'm, and I'm not proposing that what I'm saying is easy. It's not, but that's why it's the work. That's why we're living. That's what we're here for. And, and the understanding and the acknowledgement of those questions and those reflections in the context of death is, is nothing more than a gift that God is giving us while we're alive to try to value the lessons that we learned from that person, either while they were alive or in their passing, and to try to immediately begin to apply them in our own lives on a day-to-day basis. So that when we come, there's not Hashem that we won't come to our end of days, but there's not Hashem that Mashiach is going to come, and we won't need to know from this anymore, and that we'll be reunited with all of these unbelievable souls from Am Yisrael that have been taken from us in the last handful of years, and from our loved ones and our ancestors that we wish to be reunited with, that, that it should just literally not even be a thing and that Mashiach should come and that we should be blessed with that. In the meantime, in the meantime, the idea of death in the context of life is so real and so valuable and it, 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 it elevates the volume on the ticking clock of life. We hear the tick of the seconds going by and we become aware of the fact that there is a clock ticking and that we have to be cognizant of that and we need to know that we have to take advantage of every single moment that Hashem is giving us and that includes looking around you so that in the, in the older years of our own lives we can look around and say, you know what, I'm at peace with everyone around me. And I've done everything I can to be at peace with everyone around me. And if others are not at peace with me, I pray that they will be, but I'm not responsible for the peace that they need to make within themselves. I am responsible for my end of that stick that we're both holding to know that on my end, everything is at peace. You know, when people are alive, we say, Lech le shalom, menachzor le shalom. To go to peace and come back to peace. When people say, about passing, they say, be shalom, in peace. When we're living, we need to be walking to peace all the time. We need to be rodef shalom, like Aaron Akoen. So that in the end of our days, we will be be shalom, be'ezat Hashem. We will be in peace in ourselves and the people around us will be able to feel in peace as well, you know, after we've gone. Hi. So it's a lot and I appreciate you listening and I hope that, um, that it's helpful, these reflections. I'm going to share one last absolutely incredible and beautiful thing that I was blessed with that leaves things on a really super high note and helps reinforce the fact that in Olam Abba, all the nishamos that know us, all the neshamos that are tzaddikim, they know everything going on in this world. They understand what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're going through. And every now and then, Hashem gives permission for the other side to communicate with us in different ways. I've been blessed with this experience on multiple occasions. It's one of the things that I didn't understand when I was younger, but I understand that I have a significant intuitive nature, and it's one that allows me to sometimes interact with the unseen world in a way that's unique and unusual. 
But in particular, when it comes to people that I know who have passed, I've had multiple experiences throughout my life of people coming to me after they've passed in dreams and communicating to me in various ways. And I always go to a Rav and I ask about the dream and I ask whether it's nonsense or whether it's real. And Baruch Hashem, on every occasion, it's been validated that it's a legitimate dream. As I mentioned, some of my thoughts after Alfred's passing, because I was so intricately involved in his care for the last two years of his life, I was a little bit taunted by if I had missed anything, if I could have done anything differently, if there's something else I should have done for him, that I could have helped alleviate some of his suffering or maybe extend his life. You know, I think it's natural to have those thoughts, like I said. Friday night after he was buried, so he was buried, uh, he passed Monday morning, he was buried on Wednesday in Yerushalayim, and, um, and the Shabbos after he was buried, on Friday evening, he came to me in a dream. And it was an incredible dream, it was a short dream. Uh, he was a collector, he was a collector. He liked tchotchkes, you know what are tchotchkes? Little figurines and little you know, statues and little kinds of things that intrigued him. He collected them from all different kinds of cultures and backgrounds. And he has a whole big collection of tchotchkes, little like figurine kind of things you put around your house. He loved this stuff. And so in my dream, I was actually in a room with tons of tables with several of his grandchildren. And his tchotchkes were everywhere. And in my dream, he had already passed, and his grandchildren and I were sorting through all of his things, and his tchotchkes, and looking, oh, look what Saba had. Saba is his you know, grandfather. Look what Saba had this, Saba had that. And I'm going through the tchotchkes with the grandchildren. All of a sudden, I see underneath my feet that I'm no longer in the room. I'm actually on a beach. I'm still surrounded by the tables of the tchotchkes, but underneath my feet is sand. And I turn around, and behind me, is Alfred, and he has an absolutely beautiful smile on his face, and he looks exactly as he did when I met him 15 years ago. And he was so happy, and he starts to show me his tchotchkes, and I understand he hands me one specific little figurine, and I understand everything is tele telepathy, if you will. He's not speaking to me. I'm just understanding things. I'm understanding that he's showing me that he himself used to make ceramics. You know, like here in, in LA, we have this color me mine where you can go and you pick a little ceramic piece and you paint it and they put it in the kiln and then they fire it and you go home with your, your little decorated ceramic piece. And I understand he's showing me that he used to do ceramics and he hands me of all the things in the world he could hand me, he hands me a ceramic of the Winnie the Pooh character, Eeyore the donkey. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar at all with the children's, um, the children's uh, uh, cartoon, Winnie the Pooh. Um, one of the characters is Eeyore. He's a donkey. He looks a certain way, and his name is Eeyore. And I knew in the dream, this is Eeyore. And I asked him in the dream, did you make this? And he turns it over, and on the back is his name, signed, Alfred, showing me that he makes it. And I said, wow, I had no idea that you did ceramics. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing with me. And he takes me arm in arm, like a father and daughter, and we start to walk on the beach. And I start crying, and I put my head on his shoulder, and I start apologizing to him, Alfred, please forgive me if there's anything I could have done, anything I should have caught. If I missed anything, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I really wanted to do the best for you. And as we're walking, I see the beach. The end of the beach is coming closer and closer and closer. <clears throat> and he looks at me, and he says, Mia, this was my process. And I understood from him what he meant was his entire life, from start to finish. He was telling me everything was perfect, everything was exactly as it needed to be, as it should have been, and nothing could have done, no one could have done anything different. That's all he said. This was my process. And he smiled, and he was glowing, and we were at the end of the beach, and I sat up awake in bed. 
It was an incredible dream. It was a total gift from Shemaim. It put the entire family at peace, that he's in a good place, that he's doing well, and that he's happy. But more so, when I shared the dream with one of his adult granddaughters from my husband's first marriage, and I shared with her about Eeyore, that specifically this, when I woke up, I asked my husband, I said, did your dad ever do ceramics? He's like, yeah, he did ceramics for years. I never knew. So for me, this was also a, a, a help, a proof that the dream was real. So then I was sharing with one of the granddaughters, the adult granddaughters, about the dream. And she said, I, I cannot even believe what you're telling me right now. I said, why? She said, do you know in the family, each one of the four children from my husband's first marriage was a character from Winnie the Pooh. Okay, each one of them was a character from Winnie the Pooh. She said, do you know who was Eeyore? I said, no, I have no idea. I've never heard this before. It was Daniela. Everyone in the whole family knew that Daniela was his favorite grandchild. He was so funny, like he always played favorites, but everybody knew Daniela is the favorite grandchild. He was always so, he saw Daniela, he would light up. And we always would laugh about it. So the fact that he showed me this character and that it was really a message for his older grandchildren to say, you know what, I know we've been living apart for many, many, many years because they had moved to another state and they didn't get to see each other as often. He wanted them to know that no matter where they lived, they were in his heart always, that he was with them always. And in particular, the fact that it was Daniela's character is even more funny. It was like another like added bonus laugh that we all got to have on behalf of Alfred. So we have to take comfort in knowing that in Shamayim and the other side, they're with us. They're still with us. They are rooting for us. They are in Shamayim davening for us. And everything that we do here is a chizuk for all of our ancestors and all of those that we love who have passed and all of the unbelievable members of Am Yisrael that we have lost. That every mitzvah that we do, everything we take on upon ourselves to do, L'shem shamayim, to do mitzvot, to be there for other people, to hold space for others, to grow ourselves, to reflect, does so, so much for all of us and for Am Yisrael and for everyone who's gone before us. And we have to really take comfort in knowing that, that we are really, really mamish all connected. We are all connected and we all benefit from each other and all of our efforts. So I encourage you uh, on these notes to, as your homework, if you will, you know me, I like to give homework, uh, as your homework to really look around, to really investigate and see where you can continue to heal, where you can continue to be there for others, where you need to continue to do whatever you can on your end to help situations so that in the end you'll be able to say you did everything you possibly could. And Be'ezot Hashem, that Hashem should bless all of us for long and healthy lives, that Hashem should bless Am Yisrael to keep us safe, Mishmor Aleinu Mechavlei Mashiach, that we should merit living in the days of Mashiach, that those times should come immediately and in, in a peaceful way, and, um, and that we should all be able to, to grow as much as possible and make Hashem proud of us, and to be in Am, Am Yisrael and Am Kadosh. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And you guys should all have a blessed week. And um, I will, when I post the recordings, I will also send the schedule to just remind everyone, Be'ezot Hashem, when we'll meet again. Thank you so, so much for coming. You've helped me uh, in my sharing, in my being able to share. And, uh, and I hope it's helped you. Okay? Be'ezot Hashem, we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Be well, be well, be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.